Welcome to the Gentleman's Guide to Gaming. This video is the finale to my recap series of the recent Dark Ages Vampire Chronicle that I have been running. Now to recap completely what the objective in this overall chronicle was, was for the coterie of vampires, two of which were satraps, lieutenants essentially of Prince Mithras of London, they were dedicated to finding out whether the Tremere or the Salubri would be a more beneficial ally to the Baronies of Avalon, knowing that the Tremere were fast purging the Salubri of their ranks, and yet Mithras having great distaste for the usurpers, the Coterie felt inclined to side with the Salubri, without having actually addressed any of their number on this point. They were intending on heading up to Lindisfarne and the northeast of the British Isles in order to meet up with the reclusive Salubri there, Matthias, a known warrior Salubri, who had at some point in the last couple of hundred years returned from the Levant. Now, on their way back, they were due to stop in at the Lionsgate Chantry in Durham, where the Tremere make their base, and scope out what the Tremere had to offer. And so, by the time they returned to London, they should have had a solid idea in their mind of which horse to back. So, the Coterie had just arrived at the Holy Isle of Lindisfarne, which, quite separated from the land, um, seemed to be under siege when they arrived. Matthias was spotted atop the monastery on Lindisfarne, combating three flying beasts with some kind of magic that they had never seen before, some discipline that they had never witnessed before. He seemed to be literally dragging a green, almost mucus ectoplasmic substance from one of these flying figures, and it seemed to be being absorbed in that third eye on his forehead. Meanwhile, a great battle was raging at ground level as well. There seemed to be a cavalcade of mortals, knights, squires, monks, and even commoners with farming tools and so on, defending this monastery as if it were their own private kingdom uh, against a series of ghouls, biothaumaturgically created monstrosities that essentially, I suppose, look a bit like Uruk Hai. Uh, I pictured the Titan summon from Final Fantasy VII, all very much shoulders, bald head, um, stitched up mouth so that they could, and stitched up eyes so they could not be dominated or talked into doing anything other than following their Tremere Master's orders. No vampires were present beyond the flying monstrosities that were gargoyles, not that the Coterie had ever witnessed a gargoyle before. Despite Tobias, our Nosferatu, strongly resembling one with his pug-like appearance and horns upon his head. Now, the Coterie, for perhaps the first time in the entire Chronicle, worked together well in this uh, siege situation. They were behind the attackers, the Tremere, and so they launched a surprise ambush on the Tremere as they were driving home against uh, Matthias and his herd. Tobias, for instance, uh, obfuscated. He found his way into the shadow and snuck his way around the battlefield, letting blood from throats wherever he could. He was at the same time practicing the first murders that he had ever perpetrated, although admittedly these were on the battlefield. Meanwhile, Lady Cheyenne, even in her weakened state with her charred arms, was pumping blood into her celerity to pretty much dance her way around the battlefield, just cutting pell-mell, trying to s uh, slit aortas and, um, and arteries where'er she could stopping whenever she had to in order to drain more blood from her victims in order to just get back up and carry on with the dance. Sylvanius acted as a spotter. Our Cappadocian, with his enhanced ore specs, was waiting around on, on the edges of the battlefield, giving commands to the rest of the coterie, telling them where the attacks were coming from, where the Tremere forces looked at their strongest, whether any gargoyles were about to descend. Meanwhile, Lord Heil uh, and his child, Lady Coraline, were engaged in battle with some of those larger ghouls that I've previously mentioned. And one of the gargoyles dropkick dive-bombed from the sky towards Lord Heil. As far as combats go, 
it was dynamic, it was intense, it was great fun to run. To be honest, it's not something I typically enjoy running. I'm not a big fan of combat, it's not my forte as a GM. And yet, for once, this combat went about as well as I could have hoped as a storyteller, and it went pretty well for the players as well. Many of the characters end up quite badly damaged. Uh, Lord Hyle was in a pretty much one-to-one -one against the Gargoyle with his massive loads of potence versus the Gargoyle's fortitude. But the battle concluded with the Coterie and the few remaining mortals um, winning and the Tremere forces retreating, the last remaining Gargoyle flying off with uh, some of the ghouls and their mortal servitors in tow. Matthias invited them up into the monastery and they explained their purpose for being there after a day's rest and recuperation. They explained that they were there to gauge the salubri forces. How many salubri did Matthias know? Could he recruit an army of said salubri to work dedicated in the service of the baronies of Avalon? They asked what was his loyalty? Was his loyalty to Mithras or was it merely to himself? They asked how he managed to forge such a dedicated army of mortals, not one ghoul among them. They probed him with a number of very, very intelligent questions that I have to admit, as again as a storyteller, I couldn't foresee all of them and they really made me think on the spot. I had to come up with ideas for why Matthias might actually be able to sell himself as a resource to Prince Mithras, although as a stubborn old Pict that had once been sold, in, sold into slavery, taken over to the Crusades, fought his way back during which point, well, by which point his clan was largely being wiped out. He's a fairly embittered character. He explained that the mortals were loyal to him because he was reclaiming land on their behalf. Whenever Vikings or the Scots or anyone else was trying to encroach on the land, he would be there to defend him. So their loyalty to him was completely and utterly true. It was not coerced, it was not in any way disciplined and affected. These mortals loved and respected and worshipped Matthias a bit like a deity. And he welcomed this form of worship quite completely because it meant that he had a permanent herd from whom he could feed. He was a salubri and um, I s have always stuck with the salubri having one weakness which is you can only take blood from those who are willing. Because I like to think of the salubri as cult leaders, as those who groom the mortal herd, uh, much akin to setites, except they have to. The salubri have to because if they don't they will starve. And so Matthias has formed this loyal sort of knighthood around himself. And he's even training these mortals in the ways of combat um, from all of the lands that he has visited. He is not enforcing any religion or any, any particular dedication, nothing like that. He is merely providing these mortals that surround him on Lindisfarne and the surrounding areas in which he and his forces are gradually encroaching. Um, in ways of education, in writing, in, uh, as well as swordsmanship. And so he is greatly loved by the populace. And he has styled it that he has his own private army now, about 40 strong of, of full-blooded knights, who he refers to as his own personal inquisition. He can send them up against vampires during the day, and uh, no one would expect them. There is no trace of vitae in their veins, it is merely blood. The players made the connection this is before the Inquisition proper actually exists, but their characters, of course, didn't. Um, was Matthias ultimately going to be one of the causes of the Papal Inquisition? The uh, religious, well, firebrands, I suppose, who went around persecuting anyone who was not a member of their particular religion. And um, it gave them some pause, but... All credit to them, they didn't metagame, and they realised that Matthias did have something to offer, a potential new cult of Mithras, made up of mortals. This was not a weak offering. Certainly while the Tremere had blood magic, they had thermatogy, they have their gargoyles, they have their biothaumaturgical creations, all of those things, the majority of them, are restricted to operating at night. An army truly loyal to Mithras, or at least one of his servants, would go a very long way. And so they paid some thought to it.
Whilst at the monastery, Lady Cheyenne finally embraced her ghoul, who had long served her loyally after getting her, his uh, flesh ripped off his fingers by a werewolf, after be nearly drowning in the river, after having all manner of indignities endured. David, who was also seen as a sycophantic, horrible man by the rest of the coterie, but a particularly adept ghoul, and no doubt the um, NPC that saved the coterie the most amount of times, was embraced by Clan Toreador. So Lady Cheyenne not only embraced him, but also carved into his back the symbol of the clan, the crest of uh, Clan Toreador, combined with her own personal herald, so that by the time he was embraced it would be forever etched upon his skin, just as a reminder where his loyalties would lay. So, what else happened in the monastery? Well, Tobias learned a little more about the Canite heresy, albeit not too much. Lord Hyle and uh, the Lady Coraline, his child, bonded a little bit more. They did sword practice out in the courtyard, with Matthias teaching them. Sylvanius, meanwhile, performed dissections on one of the fallen gargoyles and learnt some, not much, of uh, thaumatogy. No, no points in it, but was beginning to put one and one together, if not two and two. Um, by the time that staked gargoyle was done with, it was lacking wings, limbs, and most of its torso. And so its death came as something of a mercy, I wouldn't wonder. Now, due to dice rolls, the Tremere did not lead uh, another siege against the monastery, which was quite explainable. Uh, why would they besiege a monastery, monastery containing even more vampires. They will do it when Matthias is weak and on his own. And so the coterie actually came to the decision that as the Tremere aren't supposed to be in the Baronies of Avalon anyway, and they were attacking one of the subjects of the Baronies of Avalon, then they wouldn't even take the time to stop in Durham. They had transgressed too much. They knew where loyalty was. The Coterie decided resolutely that the Salubri were the best option. Matthias even had five other Salubri that he knew of that he would be able to call upon to serve in the Baronies of Avalon if Sanctuary was offered in return. So the Coterie were strongly in bed with Salubri, despite de Camden's orders that they had to see the Tremere no matter what to get a fair gauge of the situation. And so they returned to London eventually, even with some of Matthias's contingent to, uh, upon whom they were not allowed to feed. And when they arrived in London, there were a few hints and clues to something big having happened whilst during the months in which they were away. Many prostitutes had been going missing. That was one thing. Ladies of the night, they'd just been disappearing completely. There was a huge drought of them. Um... That uh, Setite, who Lord Hyle owed payment to from the first session, had finally gone away, although the, tr the Zimitsi Saul, who had been waiting for an audience with Prince Mithras, was sta standing around looking much happier now. Aethelwulf, the usually jovial Gangrel, brought the coterie into uh, Aldgate, no, Cripple's Gate, sorry, where, when they were expecting to see Roger de Camden, they instead found a Camden with Prince Mithras, who, unannounced, had awoken from his torpor at some point in the last few months, and his feeding preference not only being prostitutes, but due to his generation vampires, he had been embracing a whole load of uh, prostitutes and just draining them and killing them. So, that was that mystery solved. And this led to the scene in which the Coterie had to explain to Prince Mithras exactly what had happened over the past few sessions. So this was like the ultimate recap for the players. They got to explain everything they'd done, paint all their successes in bright colours, try and diminish their failings. Uh, they had to explain away the fact that Lord Hyle had embraced without permission, interestingly, although, to be fair, he had slain his own child in the first session, so he was kind of allowed a one-for-one -one replacement. Lady Cheyenne had embraced without permission, that uh, they had recruited Tobias whilst en route, that they had sided with the Salubri, ultimately, that they had been responsible for the death of Samuel the Wise in St Albans, that they had nominated a leader in the uh, town of Ely, 
in Alice Upland. All of the deeds that they had partaken of, they recounted, and it was a really great storytelling scene for all of the players to take part in. Mithras addressed each of them in turn in his uh, usual stoic, albeit domineering tone, and something I do as a storyteller, most of my characters have some voice, have some kind of... Uh, have some kind of affectation to their voice. For instance, uh, Lord Camden always speaks in a very high whisper. Although I will, I will do that, and everyone will just shut up so they can hear him. Evil Wolf will speak very much like Brian Blessed. Or um, Lord, Lord Amber will always have his shoulders up. He's very um, much like, um, I, I forget his name, the... Uh, the guy who plays, who played William Hartnell in that recent um, Doctor Who documentary, he's also in Game of Thrones, and so on. I always uh, attach some kind of characteristic through my roleplay of an NPC. So when I get to Mithras, I just play him exactly like me. I just play him like me, but authoritative, wanting answers. You will tell me exactly what I want to know. And it breaks completely from the way I play all other vampires. And it, it brings the, um, the game sort of close in. All the players start playing their characters a little more personally. Now, Mithras revealed that he actually had a Tremere on site. That this Tremere, in fact, had come to Mithras to offer Tremere allegiance to the Baronies of Avalon whilst the rest of the coterie were away. Because the country failed in two major, like, well, three major aspects. The first was in Lady Cheyenne's embracing David without permission. She didn't have authority to embrace a child. The second was in not actually going to Durham. Lord Hyle was sent on this mission in order to reach Matthias, a known warrior. He was a martial character, Lord Hyle, and so he was seen as the one most likely to be able to reason with the Salubri. Lady Cheyenne, a spy from the Courts of Love, that's where she's typically based, was due to intrude, I suppose, adopt a guise, spy upon the Tremere of Durham, and find her way within that Chantry's walls. So two strikes against Lady Cheyenne, I'm afraid to say. The other mistake was in Sylvanius's offering up his organs for sacrifice in Ely to House Flambeau that had somehow, according to Mithras and this Tremere just in the other room, found their way back to the Order of Hermes and via the Order of Hermes back to House Tremere. Various things were afoot, but the players played everything masterfully. I cannot take away from them. They did such a brilliant job of role-playing throughout this entire chronicle. It would have been very harsh for me to have ordered any of their deaths or ordered any of them to be put to torpor. What instead happened was we focused largely on their successes. Mithras came to agreement that the Salubri could find sanctuary in the Baronies of Avalon. And this was a discussion purely for this chamber but the Coterie would need to pursue some further tasks. They would need to intrude on the Chantry in Durham, and they would need to take out all the Tremere from within. Simultaneously, they would need to launch an attack on the Chantry in Winchester, a full-bodied attack, which would, bear, which would be, uh, shall we say, supported by the forces of the Baronies of Avalon the other vampires that were subjects of Mithras. So that would be a rout whilst stabs in the back were going on in Durham. And another part of the coterie would have to go out to the fiefdoms of the Black Cross, as Mithras wanted negotiators to go and meet with Hardstadt and his various offspring with a deal that on the proviso that the fiefdoms of the Black Cross abandon their allies of the Tremere, that if the Baronies of Avalon assisted the fiefdoms of the Black Cross with dividing the Courts of Love straight down the middle, the east going to the Black Cross, the west going to Avalon, 
then we would have business, shall we say. It was a grandiose plan, and it would only work if it all took place at the same time. Because, if Winchester was attacked and Durham was not being caught up with various assassinations, then the head of the Tremere there, Mia Linda, among all of her many gargoyles, would of course rush to their defence. And there would be allies of the Tremere from the north, from York, from Winchester, being able to help with the defence. If the Tremere were being struck on two uh, flanks at the same time, two fronts at the same time, then you can see that they'd be somewhat caught up. But troublingly, of course, the Fiefdoms of the Black Cross are allied with the Tremere, and Mithras could not allow for the Black Cross to actually slip from his, well, the potential of an alliance, and he could not allow for them to potentially attack Avalon. They would not be able to withstand an attack from the Fiefdoms of the Black Cross and whilst fighting a war with the Tremere on their own home soil. So, all of these things would have to occur simultaneously, which will be the next chronicle. The Coterie is essentially going to have to split up and they will be focusing on their strengths. The players rolling up new characters to deal with different things. For instance, Cheyenne will be leading the spy mission in Durham. Lord Hyle will be leading the war party against the Tremere of Winchester. Sylvanius will be heading to the Fetums of the Black Cross as a seneschal and diplomat, and so on. Unfortunately, this left the question of Cheyenne's transgressions. Uh, Mithra stripped her of her title. She was no longer satrap. She would have to earn that by being the spy that she was recruited to be. And uh, due to her transgression in embracing, she was ordered to hand David over to Tobias, the Nosferatu, who would have to treat David as his ward and teach him in the ways of the knight. This put Cheyenne's back up somewhat, but it was a lot better than the alternative of putting her to final death for embracing without permission and not actually doing what the mission called of her. Which, in fairness, was partly the Coterie's fault as well, uh, for not encouraging her to do it, but she was a spy, so that was kind of her role. <laughs> um, Tobias decided that he would make his domain in Serum with Lord Hyle, and he would assist with the Canite Heresy, who were making their small base down on Salisbury Plain, or rather in the uh, wetlands, where the new town of Salisbury was being forged by Bethany the Heretic. The Coterie basically split up uh, after dealing with the Tremere in the other room. Mithras said, I cannot order you to do it, but no one is protecting him. He, um, I will not violate my guest right by uh, destroying someone in my own domain. However, if you were to do it without my knowledge, then I would hardly be able to punish you for it, would I? He said, obviously, at which point he left. So, what's more, the Coterie were awarded St Albans, I believe, as a domain, should they want it, now that Samuel the Wise was, well, had been killed, and he was a useless vampire anyway, even Mithras acknowledged that. And uh, Ambrogino Giovanni, Giovanni ha had approached Sylvanius regarding a particular deal. Um, that we will go into at another point. The Another thing that I missed, Matthias um, did speak to uh, Sylvanius about Excalibur, because if you recall, Sylvanius was seeking the bones of King Arthur, and um, he was directed towards Glastonbury, um, which will be another adventure for another time. We've essentially left the Chronicle open with loads of sprawling threads that none of them will actually come together for the next few decades. Essentially, we will rejoin this Chronicle after several years of spying has taken place, of rallying forces has taken place, of diplomacy has taken place. And at the crucial point, probably around 1230, 1240 AD, uh, that is when Mithras will send the message. You must all fulfil your roles. Any one of them could fail. If one of them fails, it may be okay, another two may succeed. But this is now going to be Vampire, the War of Princes, spread out across a very large map. If one thing, if one domino topples, and it goes the wrong way, 
things could end up very bad for the baronies of Avalon. However, if it goes the right way, then things could turn out very differently for the Tremere that we know and love of Vampire the Masquerade, and the Salubri, for that matter. So, I thank you very much for watching. I thank you very much for keeping up with this chronicle. By all means, comment if you uh, so choose, and if you have any questions about the chronicle, do uh, post here, or specifically, if you need to contact me, find me through the Gentleman Gamer page on Facebook. I reply to messages on there far quicker than I do on YouTube. And yes, I thank you very, very much for sticking with us, and thank you very much for the players for playing fantastically, especially those of whom... Uh, this was their first vampire game. Only one of them has actually played a Chronicle of Vampire before, so they all did absolutely marvellous, marvellously. Oh, and uh, one last thing, the secret behind Alice Upland, and um, why she was constantly being surrounded by crows all the time. Um, what she was really, uh, was actually...